Good evening, everyone. I am Katerina Vlahos, co-chair of the Connecticut ACES Task Force and Community Innovations Manager for Bridgeport Prospers, the United Way of Coastal Fairfield County. The task force is a collaborative effort focused on raising awareness of the impact of trauma, building resilience, and improving the health and well-being of everyone in our communities. I would like to welcome you to tonight's discussion. Let's pause for a moment. Let's come together. Let's ground ourselves in this brave space to hold this courageous conversation that will bring about healing and positive change. We invite you to listen with humility and learn as we elevate the voices and unique experiences of our panelists. We encourage you to engage in the conversation by commenting on the Facebook live stream. And now I have the honor to introduce to you Dr. Vanessa Lyles, co-director of PT Partners, a resident-owned initiative for self-determination in low-income housing. Dr. Lyles, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Katerina, and thank you all for joining us tonight for this very important event. I have the pleasure tonight of introducing you to a wonderful woman that I have had the pleasure of being in community with for several years here in Bridgeport and with the, our organization, PT Partners. And when we had the opportunity to think about a moderator for this event, Senator Marilyn Moore came to my mind immediately. I, she came to my mind because of the work that she does for girls and, and women in Bridgeport and beyond in her entire area. And, and for the state of Connecticut. So I am extremely pleased to introduce her to you tonight. And I am going to, she had gave me the option of a shorter bio or a longer bio. And I definitely wanna share with you her longer bio because I think that we all need to be reminded of the greatness of black women and the role that, that black women have played in making change in our communities. Marilyn Moore is a life, lifelong Bridgeport resident. She is mother to three, Michelle Bradshaw Ellis, Felicia Bradshaw and James Bradshaw Jr. and grandmother to nine. Marilyn attended Bridgeport Public Schools, Susitana Community College and the University of Bridgeport. A disciple of Mount Erie Baptist Church, she declares that God has blessed her abundantly and all the glory and honor belong to him. Marilyn credits her years at AT&T as laying the foundation for the, her future in corporate, nonprofit and the political arena. After retiring from AT&T, Marilyn shifted the, the corporate to human services from corporate to human services in the nonprofit sector when she joined Planned Parenthood as the outreach worker to educate women about breast cancer and early detection. She launched a nonprofit expanding the work she did at PPPC and became an advocate for women's health and joined the Breast Cancer Crusade to build awareness and support survivors. In 2002, Marilyn founded the Witness Project of Connecticut, which serves to address and reduce the incidence of death rates of breast cancer among low income and African American women. With the assistance of dedicated staff and board members, over 1,500 women were reached annually in the battle against breast cancer. This year, she received Planned Parenthood of Southern New England's first Voice and Vision Award for her leadership in advocating for health equity, advancing reproductive freedom for Connecticut women and families. And she is most proud of this award because it is when she began her work more than 20 years ago addressing health equity for women. She is nationally known for her advocacy on behalf of breast cancer and is an active participant in the war against hunger, social justice, and racial equity. To further improve health outcomes, she has become an advocate to co combat chronic diseases through nutrition and implemented body and soul in several Bridgeport churches. Marilyn stays connected to information and advocacy groups by actively participating in projects whose mission addresses food access and is a member of the network support team for the Connecticut Food Systems Alliance and is the Connecticut ambassador for the Food Solutions New England Coalition who seeks to build regional solutions for food sustainability within the New England states. Locally, Marilyn organized coalitions in Bridgeport to address food equity and as a result of the city of Bridgeport formed a food policy council. Marilyn has been involved in local politics since she 
worked on the campaign for Tisdale for mayor and has coordinated several successful campaigns. In 2013, Marilyn challenged a six year incumbent for a state Senate seat and was successful in her bid to represent Trumbull, Bridgeport and Monroe. She was sworn in on January 7, 2015 and is currently chair of human services, general bonding and vice chair of finance, revenue and bonding and is a member of, legislative of the Legislative Management Committee. Her commitments to her constituents are to address health equity, living wage, and promote legislation that supports safe communities and protects the rights of all. During, during campaigns, she seeks refuge in Psalms 27 and believes it is a pathway to Palms 30, Psalms 30. <laughs> Marilyn's commitment to community is exemplified by the numerous awards, accolades, and organizations that she links herself to that include the founder of the Witness Project of Connecticut, past board chair in Hunger, Hunger, Connecticut, past president, Bridgeport Pride, Black Pride, and um, Les Trees Business and Professional Women's Organization, past board member, Cancer Care, Hall Neighborhood House, African American Affairs Commission, Woman of the Year, NAACP Community Service Award, Neg Negro Business and Professional Women's Women, Woman of the Year, and Sojourn Tooth Award, Cape Verdean Women's Association Community Service Award, New Hope Missionary Baptist Church Mother of the Year Award, Juneteenth Parade Marshal, American Cancer Society Lifesaver Education Award, Cancer Information Services Community Partner, President's Cancer Panel, and currently a board member of Juneteenth of Fairfield County. I am extremely proud and, and happy to introduce to you Senator Marilyn Moore. Good evening, everyone. I uh, I think you heard in the, the bio that I stay connected uh, through being connected to different programs. And this is one of the ones that have just touched my heart in so many ways. Uh, and even though I was in grade school in the 60s and the late 50s, a lot has not changed when I reviewed the, the movie uh, to see what's happening with young black girls. What is different is I didn't recognize that I was be being treated any certain way because of the color of my skin. And that's what is different about my childhood and what we're seeing right now with all of the young people understanding who they are and understanding that the things that are happening to them may be happening because of the color or the shade of their skin. And that's when things really begin to change, when people can see themselves in something and see the change that's coming and see the change that's happening and being a part of that change. For, for that reason, I am so proud to be here and for Vanessa to invite me to be on this platform uh, at this point in my life that I still can be engaged in this process and move as much stuff as I can, not only as a legislator, but in my community. Uh, in in my any any room that I'm in, that I can elevate this conversation and make people aware of what's going on and have a seat at the table, but also making way for someone else to come to the table while I'm there and be at the table with me and take on that role. So I'm very proud to be here tonight. So I think uh, uh, Althea Arkea is going to introduce our panelists now. Hi everybody, we are happy. We are ready. One second. Oh wow, just me. <laughs> You're in the show. <laughs> We're Is, this on, Is it okay? You're live. Oh. Hey. <laughs> oh, it just seems like my, my camera's flipped the other way. I don't know. It's like we can see you. Okay. All right, let's see. Okay. Well, while she's getting ready, I do want to say that this uh, filming, I watched it, I did the audio book first because uh, I really didn't have time to just read. And I think I want to go back and read it because there's so much that you can get from actually reading your, yourself. But I did the audio book and then I went and watched the movie twice. Uh, and I was, I was really uh, feeling as though I wish I could have had all my granddaughters, they're all grown, but 
when they were little to sit and watch this along with me. And that's how I think uh, we should be thinking about this is we should we need to watch this with our with our daughters and with our granddaughters and with our children in the community. OK, Althea, you need to uh, unmute your, yourself. And we'll be able to hear you. There you go. <laughs> Thank this, you. Is, this is a new platform. Yeah. It is a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you today, Senator Moore. Thank you. It is where I live. Yeah. I sit in this chair and uh, <laughs> change the background every now and then for a, a throw cover. And I spend the whole day here on, on these type of calls. So, But I'm glad to be able to do it. I. We're glad to have you. I feel glad like to be I'm able to be to meet all of you all. Uh-oh. Is it just the two of us right now? Right now, we're the only two on the screen, and as you introduce people, they'll show them. Okay, perfect. Just feel like second uh, visual. Well, what we could do is we could introduce one person and let them come on and say okay. a little bit about themselves to, to move it along. Um, okay. Who's the have first they, person you have? Well, you're first. Have they introduced you yet? Yes. Oh, and now you're my friend. We have the illustrious representative Robin Porter. <laughs> Unmute yourself, Robin. Rep Porter. Hello, hey, Senator hello. Moore. Hello, Althea. How are Hi. you? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. Glad to have you. Reporter, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. I mean, I am. I think my, my proudest moment is I'm a grandma. Uh, <laughs> oof, my, my kids might say, what happened to being a mom? But, you know, once you become a grandma, you... Uh, you step it up, right? It's grand, but um, I am State Representative Robin Porter. I represent the 94th District of New Haven and Hamden. I chair the Labor and Public Employees Committee, and I'm also a member of the Appropriations and Judiciary Committee. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here this evening um, sharing this platform with the illustrious and phenomenal Senator Marilyn Moore. Yeah. Um, Yes, highly esteemed and, and, and truly respected and honored. I have a lot of love for Senator Moore. Um, and I'm just excited to be here. You know, um, I did myself watch this uh, last evening and I'm just listening to what Senator Moore was sharing. And, you know, when it began, it opened up with um, a very brutal act being done on a young black girl. And yeah. I have to tell you, um, it startled me, you know, I jumped mm -hmm. and it just felt like somebody had put their foot on my chest and I had to literally mm -hmm. physically get up mm -hmm. and walk around to just kind of shake it off because I just don't understand how these things are happening uh, still. But um, yeah. i excited you, to be it. here. Very excited to be here. Glad to have you. I'm going to say a little bit more about you and introduce the rest of your panelists. Um, we have Ms. Sabir Gordon. I'm going to say a bit, a bit about Representative Porter because she didn't give d d great justice to, to what she does. She is truly someone who is a great champion for efforts and realities and situations affecting the disenfranchised and the marginalized. And we thank you for being that voice and that champion at the state level, uh, Robin, and, and here in the city of New Haven. So we salute you. Uh, but Rep Representative Porter was sworn into office April 28, 2014. She chairs the Labor and Public Employees Committee and is a member of the Appropriations and Judiciary Committees. In 2019, she led the passage of Connecticut's $15 minimum wage. Hand clap to that. And we know we're going to push that on to the livable wage and the nation's most progressive PFML um, legislation to date. Let me say that again, the nation's most progressive PFML legislation to date. In addition, she sits on the Ju uh, Juvenile Justice Policy Oversight Committee 
um, which this conversation hopefully will help to inform and, and, and give her some jewels that she can bring back um, and do her work as she does, where she continues to lead progressive advancements for juvenile justice for reforms. I introduce and present to you, uh, Representative uh, Robin Porter. Next we have Ms. Sabira Gordon, um, another fighter and advocate um, for uh, children and youth and families. Um, Sabira was born and raised in Jamaica in a small rural community within a two, with a 2% literacy rate. Her mother was one of the few who could read and Sabira quickly realized the value of schooling as her mother assisted neighbors with undertakings that required more than first grade education. As a former executive director of Connecticut's Commission on Equity and Opportunity, Sabir worked to create equitable solutions and continues to do so for communities of color. As CONCAN's executive director, she aims to recreate a public school system that reflects the America of today and tomorrow. She holds a bachelor's from um, Bates College and a master's from George Washington University. And we celebrate the recent passing of the African-American Latinx history curriculum now being required in schools. And we hand clapped uh, Ms. Gordon for all of her efforts of making that happen. Welcome, Sabira. Hi, girl. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, this is this is a family discussion. I'm so honored to be here in great company this evening. And I can just say when I the film, I want I I'm gonna be 100 percent honest. I couldn't watch all of it. I have a young, I have a three year old daughter, and uh, she's that girl who people will try to put in the corner and tell her to be quiet. And you know, she is a firecracker. She will tell you her mind. She is that girl. And I just you know, it worries me that she's going to be, she's going to have to deal with a lot of, I didn't grow up in the U.S., but, you know, I've lived here long enough to know that the color of her skin and her body is going to be something that we're going to have to have lots of conversations about in the future. But for now, I tell her every day, there's no glass ceiling, there's nothing, just shine and be the best that you can be every day. So I'm very excited to be here, excited for this conversation, but just troubled. I think that's how I'm feeling. I watched that today and I am just troubled yeah. at what young black girls are going through in America. I agree. I definitely agree. There were some triggers. It was triggering me a bit just watching it. Um, next, we have Miss Jackie Davis. Jackie was born and raised in Waterbury, Connecticut. She was a proud graduate of Wilby High School. Jackie attended Howard University, where she studied human development and psychology and graduated number one, yes, number one in the School of Education. Her mother will be proud, a very uh, 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 lauded uh, uh, educator in the city of Waterbury. Ms. Lynette Davis, she continued her education at Wheaton College in Illinois and received her master's degree in clinical psychology. After receiving her master's degree, Jackie settled in Chicago and worked as a middle school teacher and a child and adolescent therapist at Community Counseling Centers of Chicago, providing care coordination services within Chicago public schools. Jackie was excited to bring her educational achievements and experience as both a teacher and a therapist back to the Waterbury Public School System, where she has worked as a prevention specialist, behavior technician, leader in residence, and now um, as the district's climate uh, and attendance coordinator. And she is getting it done, getting it done, um, doing her city proud. And her passion has long been to help young people strive towards reaching their full potential. I present to you, Miss Jackie Davis. Thanks okay. for being with us, Jackie. How's my sound? It's sounding a little etchy on my end. Can you hear me? Uh, I think we, everybody, I think I can hear you fine. Okay. So, so I have to admit, I'm a little starstruck right now. All this <laughs> black girl magic on this. I know. Like, I'm trying to take it all in and compose myself. Um, <laughs> but I think um, when I watched the film, I, I was very reflective at first because um, as you heard, by the grace of God, you know, I was able to go to the capstone of Black Education, Howard University, and do very well there. However, that's only after I was on the brink of push out myself, you know, and the only reason why I wasn't pushed out is because I had a praying, no nonsense mama who pulled me out of public school for a year and then put me back in. Um, but just thinking of how many of my young sisters did not have that opportunity, you know, and how much potential, um, is sort of buried and covered up because of that push out effect. 
And so I, it was very a time of, of reflection for me. I have two nieces who just graduated from high school and, and they had some of the same struggles that I had when I was in high school. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation tonight to talk about, you know, how do we move past this? You know, how do we change this cycle, interrupt this cycle? Um, I will say that the other part about this film was that I was very excited to be able to hear the young girls voice their opinions and talk about their experience in a way that just um, highlighted their resilience. And so mm -hmm. I was troubled and hopeful at the same time. So looking forward to a great dialogue tonight. Welcome, glad to have you. All right, our next panelist, Ms. Jennifer Walsh. Jennifer is a certified TRE provider through TRE for All and is in private practice in Fairfield, Connecticut. She works with children, adolescents, and adults who are suffering from the effects of chronic and toxic stress. And if there was a time where our folks are dealing with that, it is now. Adverse childhood experiences and trauma. Jennifer holds a bachelor's degree in social work from the University of New Hampshire master's degree in special education from the University of St. Joseph, and is a licensed massage therapist in the state of Connecticut. Currently, Jennifer is a graduate student in the School of Social Work at Sacred Heart University. I present to you, Ms. Jennifer Walsh, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be a part of this. Um, I, like the other women were speaking, um, very, very frustrated um, in that we continue to expect um, adult behavior from adolescents and that we continue to, you know, adultify these girls and, you know, criminalize their behavior in ways that only further traumatize them and perpetuate the same behaviors. And so thank you for letting me be part of this conversation. Thank you for being here. We look forward to hearing from you. Next up, we have Sharice Bacon. Sharice Bacon is originally from Stamford, Connecticut. She's a dedicated mother of three and a resilient community leader. I'm hearing feedback. Is there feedback? Yeah. Yeah. We're getting there. Is it just started? Yeah. Um, Sharice is a dedicated mother of three. There we go, and a resilient community leader. She currently lives in Bridgeport and is a resident of the PT Barnum Apartments and serves as an executive committee member of PT Partners, which is a resident owned initiative for self-determination in low income public housing. Yes, Sharice is persistent at working with and for the community in which she resides. Additionally, she is the former president of the PT Resident Council and currently, excuse me, Lost that there. Sorry about that. Technology. And currently serves as a treasurer for the council and currently sits as a member of the NAACP. Moreover, she has earned a number of certifications and accolades, including being a graduate from the Greater Bridgeport Council of Churches, um, Create Culinary Careers Training Course. All right, she can cook. All right. Ms. Bacon is certified in mental health. Uh, first aid and serve safe food protection management. Importantly, most importantly, she doesn't hesitate to use her knowledge and influence to serve her community. Awesome. She dedicates her time, sweat, and energy. In this way, Sharice continues to be a valued asset for the community she is a part of. Introducing to you all, Ms. Sharice Bacon. Welcome. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, now, when I film the, when I seen the film, it really, really hit home for me because my children are fresh out of the public schools. They're high school graduates and they were affected by the trauma in the schools. So knowing that it's nationwide and not just here really affected me. And the ACE, the ACE program can really help everywhere. So it's really beneficial to know that I can let people be informed about it and help people be knowledge, knowledgeable. Thank you, glad to have you. Next we'll have uh, Ms. Hannah Michelle. Michelle. Oh boy. Hannah is an alumni of Connecticut Against Violence. She's a graduate of Warren 
Harding High School in Bridgeport. And she currently attends the University of Connecticut. Go Huskies. Hannah is active within her community and her church. Her work with Connecticut Against Violence helps to promote positive communication with other students from various back backgrounds um, in and across Bridgeport. So all parties feel involved and that their voice has been heard. Um, I present to you, Ms. Hannah Michelle. You wanna say hello, Hannah? There we go. Hi, it's an honor to be amongst all you guys. Um, I think the film did not surprise me because I could relate being an African-American woman. And also it has a lot to do with discrimination and statistically analyzing African-American women. Glad to have you, Hannah. And last but not least, we have Jessica Lopez. Jessica Lopez is a case manager at Bridgeport RISAP, the juvenile, Ju RISAP's Juvenile Review Board. She received her BA in criminal justice from the University of Bridgeport with a concentration in human security. Jessica started at RISAP in 2015 as a part-time bilingual case manager and has held different positions throughout her years there. Eventually, she transitioned to a full-time case manager and is also the co-facilitator, facilitator, I should say, of the Greater Bridgeport List, the local interagency inter strategic team since 2019. She loves the work that she does and continues to strive to support youth and young adults that might be at risk. Thank you all for being here. And I'll now turn it over to Senator Moore to moderate the conversation. Again, welcome. Thank you, Althea. And thank you all for being here tonight. Once again, I wanna welcome you all. Uh, this is gonna be a very candid, open uh, conversation. I hope that you'll share you know, from your bottom of your hearts and your experiences. We have some questions that I'd like to start with just to frame what you do and how it, it can impact our children. So when you think about criminalization and an equal treatment of black girls, do you wanna tell me how what you do in the community or in your job or in the legislature, how that impacts our, our girls? And I'll start with a Representative Porter. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, as you know, we, we just had a, a meeting today with the Juvenile Justice Policy Oversight Committee, uh, affectionately known as JPOC. And um, one of the recommendations that I'm making as the, the chair of the subcommittee on education is exactly what all of this is about. We're talking about removing SROs from schools. We're talking about removing school um, suspensions and expulsions and doing away with um, the things that really do exacerbate. And it's amazing to me when we start to delve into this work, how it's so intersectional and how each level plays into one another and just creates this, this, this steady pathway of what is um, known as the prison, the school to prison pipeline. So that is some of the work that I'm doing. I sit on the Judiciary Committee where a lot of this stuff will end up being introduced and come through. And um, we are really concentrating on making sure that we're addressing issues that actually hinder the growth and, and the nurturing and the love and the caring that all students should get. But we know uh, black and brown students suffer at the hands of disproportionate uh, contact with police. Um, they, they, they take those actions and they actually end up dropping out of school. When you think about it, if you're being excluded, I mean, it's, it's shaming a child. Um, and the other thing that resonated with me, especially doing this work in the um, documentary they talked about, the mother talked about, she corrected the father and said, no, the teacher was bullying our child. Um, so all this is intertwined. You know, we have bullying laws. We have all kind of laws on the books. So currently that is what we're pushing to address the issue of the disproportionate impact that um, brown, black and brown children have with um, police enforcement and the way that they're, they're singled out in schools like we saw in this documentary. Thank you, Representative Porter. Jessica, we really didn't get a chance to hear about you. Would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about you and then answering uh, responding to what I asked uh, earlier about how your work plays out in the community. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Jessica Lopez. Um, I'm a Bridgeport Riasap uh, Juvenile Review Board case manager. I've been working there for about five and a half years. 
Um, for those of you who don't know what a juvenile review board is, it's a diversionary program from court. So it's um, mostly just dealing with youth who get referrals for um, habitual truancy, um, any kind of lower level misdemeanors, things in that nature. Um, we also get court referrals. So for like uh, lower level offenses like larceny, um, breach of peace, uh, disorderly conduct, things in that nature. So we basically just work with the youth, just trying to keep them out the system um, and, you know, just provide that case management component, just making sure that they, they have all the support that they need, whether it's school support, whether it's home support, just any type of basic needs, things in that nature. Um, as far as the as your question, um, I mean, me me personally, like just having to deal with that in the school system, like we also, like me as a case manager, I go into the schools and provide school support as well. Like sitting in the PPT meetings, you know, when one of my clients are suspended, um, you know, just, just including uh, one of our education uh, advocates that we work well with just to come up with those, um, those type of supports to figure out like, why, you know, why are they getting out of school suspensions? Why aren't they, you know, coming up with some type of restorative justice practices within the schools, um, things in that nature, and just advocating mostly just for the youth. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome. Uh, Hannah, would you like to share? Can you unmute? Thank you. Um, so in the community, what, what type of things are you doing uh, that you could use what you've learned today or how you see it? Well, my community, I started doing stuff in the community in high school where we tried to connect other schools with other schools. Like, for instance, with Harding Central, Bassett come together and talk out their issues and problems against each other because, in my opinion, I feel like all minority students and should not be against each other. We should be as one. We all go through the same problems in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It's not like we all don't go through the same issues. So that's what we do at Connecticut against Thank violence. Thank you. Sabera? Um, so when I worked at the legislature, we did a lot of work around chronic absenteeism, which is one of the first ways where young people can, you can kind of start to see trends with chronic absenteeism and the way the state used to count or look at absenteeism didn't really give you a holistic picture. So it was really important for us to really figure out and change the law. So chronic absenteeism, it, it's one of the number one causes of students to drop out. And you could see the stats where young black girls or young girls of color were co constantly being chronically absent, but because of how we were allowing people to call out, it was not being recorded in the right way. So we changed it working with a lot of legislators. So every time a child was, was absent from school, regardless of what the issue was, it was called an absence. And that allowed you to see, sometimes someone might be calling out because that child had asthma. Sometimes that person was calling out because their child or something else was happening and it would be an excused absence, but it still didn't mean that it wasn't an absence. And that would kind of, you miss a certain number of days from school and then you end up being on the path to drop out. Also, I think I will say the work that we've been doing around making sure that um, black and brown kids have someone in front of the classroom that looks like them is incredibly important. We, there was something in the film where there was an educator who said, you know, I know how to connect to those girls. This is not, a, they're not acting up to me, they're being themselves. And I think that for sure just really shows that this is, you know, if you have a similar experience or if you know that you see someone doing something and they're not just doing it because they're trying to be inappropriate, you know something's going on because you felt that. Um, Representative Porter and I joke about the look you know there's a look that a black woman gives you in that moment and you know what that means. So is, as an educator, if you can see that in a young girl, you really know what's going on and you're not, it's not, a, it's not something that requires you need, you need to be suspended or expelled. It means you need to be pulled aside and say, hey sis, what's going on? Let's have a conversation about it. So I think doing that work has really, and you know, we've done a lot in Connecticut. We still have a really long way to go but by addressing that, I think is one of the ways where you'll see a lot less kids or young girls going through that system and starting that school to prison pipeline, 
because if they have someone that looks like them who recognizes those triggers, they might be able to change that trajectory for the future. You know, Sabara, that's a good point because also it's about uh, kind of like a mirror that you know what that means. And it's nece not necessarily about you at that moment, it could be a thought that they had that something that happened earlier. It could have been a trigger for something that happened before getting into school. And part of it is the teacher shouldn't be taking it so personal. You know, don't try to read me unless you got some special skills that, <laughs> that you can see what I'm feeling. But that is a great point because I think because that's where it sometimes begins and they call it attitude. You know, she had an attitude because she looked at me a certain way, right? Uh, that may not have anything to do with them. So I, I see that being as probably one of the most common triggers that they don't like the look uh, or the rolling of the eyes or, or any of that, but it shouldn't be enough for you to start treating me differently. So thank you. Jennifer, you want to share with us how you how it plays into the work that you're doing? Besides giving me a massage, let's talk about that later. But... Uh, <laughs> Let's talk about the children now. Um, so for like with regard to children um, for the last six months as part of the program through the School of Social Work at Sacred Heart University, um, I have been working with Norwalk Acts in addressing issues of racial and educational equity. Um, and so part of that is um, utilizing restorative practices and trauma informed care. Um, and providing professional development for educators. So as an ex-educator myself, I can tell you that um, teacher education does not focus on any of these issues. And so when these educators are in the building, um, whether it be, you know, actually, you know, expert knowledge on adolescent development or the signs and symptoms of, you know, trauma or how depression you know, appears when it is the root, you know, a root cause of trauma um, and providing these educators with more tools in the toolbox to manage what's happening in the classroom. Um, through my private practice, um, I, I deal with individuals that, you know, have layers and layers of trauma like these girls. And so when we consider, you know, possibly the home environment, possibly systemic injustices, um, you know, historical racism and intergenerational trauma that they're already showing up at the doorstep, you know, behind the eight ball. And so when they start to behave in certain ways and educators don't understand uh, what that is and why they're responding that way, that, you know, is the connective piece that I work on. Thank you. Jackie? Yeah, so working in a school system, um, part of my job is to actually implement some of the legislation that Sabira talked about working on. Um, and I think it is really important for us to understand the impact of chronic absenteeism on this whole push out cycle. So when a student is absent for a prolonged amount of time, for whatever reason, they're missing out on instruction. So when they come back into the classroom, um, sometimes they're lost. They don't know what's happening because they, they've not been there to receive the instruction that they need. And so what will happen is if a student doesn't know what's going on and they're, 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 they're not connected with what's happening in the classroom, they may begin to act out. And so if they act out, if you don't have a teacher that's connecting with you, that teacher may send you to the office, you may get a referral. Um, and while you're in the office, you're missing out on more instruction. And so when you go back to class, you're further behind. So you act out again, and then it leads to a suspension. And so you lose more instruction. So that by the time you come back, it's just this bad cycle of, of missing out on the, the, what you need the most to succeed. And so the part that really um, troubles me is the role that that plays on the psyche of the student. So the student may begin to believe that, oh, this school thing's not for me. I'm not smart. I can't cut it. I can't keep up with everyone else. When in fact, it's a systemic problem that's keeping them from accessing what they need. And so part of my role in the education system is to look at some of the causes of chronic absenteeism, um, systemically, personally, whatever's happening um, with families, and making sure that schools have the resources to be able to support students and getting that Thank education you, that they need. Uh, 
Sharice, would you like to comment on that? I know you're in a community uh, and you're on the ground working with a lot of youth and you also have your yes. your own children that you're going to work with. You're going to mute me yeah. to see if that's a problem. Being on the ground. To see if that's a problem. Yeah, being on the ground, it helps me um, give the children information and advocate for them better because I understand the problems that they're having. I've been through it myself, going through the public school system. So advocating for them is easier for me, even helping the parents to advocate for their children because some of them don't know what to say, how to address the teachers, how to address the school system. Nothing. So literally in my organization, we go to PPT meetings with them. We tell them how to conduct themselves, what they should expect, um, the policies within the schools, if they're helping them, if they're not. And I'm not the only parent that's going through this. So the community is like, it's just, it's, it's, I just like to help the community. It helps them understand and to give them information about what they're doing right and wrong. Because I believe that a community is a big part of the child's. Thank you, Sharice. Let me just ask you. So they mentioned a survey, the Adverse Childhood Experience Survey. Uh, educators in, in on the panel, can you speak to that and tell me, are they introducing that in the schools and what you know? So Barry, you might be able to help us with that also. Is anybody familiar with the uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey? So yeah, I know in um, Waterbury Public Schools and another, a number of other districts in the state of Connecticut, we have been introduced to the ACES study. I know the State Department of Education has done some training in districts about um, what that is and how it shows up in the classroom. And so I think it is crucial for educators to understand how situations in a child's life impacts their behavior and their response to certain triggers. And so I think um, for those districts that have not yet made this a part of their training for staff, you must consider talking to them about ACEs. There is um, a line in the film that talks about everyone has an ACEs score. It may be a high one or it may be a low one, but it impacts all of us. And so we really have to be mindful of, you know, what is coming into, into our buildings. One of the activities that the State Department of Education actually does when they do this, this training is they have the attendees to take the survey and they write out their ACES number. And so in all of the sessions that I've been in, most of the educators have um, a low ACE score, you know, for the most part. And then they ask them to think about one of their students and the information that they know about them and to school, take the survey based on the information that they know of that student. And most times the A score for that student is pretty high. And so being able to understand that gap between the educator's experience and the student's experience, I think is crucial in being able to dismantle that whole push out system. So for our audience, let me just say what the adverse childhood experience question is. Uh, and it's called ACEs, it's used to measure childhood trauma. And the evaluation consists of 10 questions that fall under three types of ACEs, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. I think we could use this as adults also on people coming to work, how they come into work sometimes. And one little thing triggers them, right? It's not just children. One thing that someone says triggers them and the rest of the day is shot. The thing about adults is they have other ways of managing it, right? Uh, and they have more options than, than children do. And, and for many, unless you have a, a boss that's underneath you all the time, you can kind of work your way through it. You know, some people go have something to eat. Some people have, you know, just go and shut the door. But our kids don't have that option to walk away and, and think about what just happened. Maybe they should have that option that they can go someplace, take a moment, figure out what happened and then come back into the room. But they don't, but they often don't. So Barry, do you want to speak on that? Um, so what I would love to see happen is that this needs to be something that's done across the state. What's interesting when you look at ACEs is 
it's something that transcends socioeconomics. And sometimes it's one of those things where trauma can exist anywhere. So I think it's really important that it doesn't matter if it's a high resource district or a low resource district. I'd love to see all school districts have this where um, you know the A score. I, I, I don't think it should be used in a punitive way. But it, help, it helps educators be aware of what kinds of trauma they have in their classroom. I used to, I used to, one thing that used to always bother me about my son's school, they would, would always start the conversation like, kids, tell your moms and dads this, 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 this. And I always would say, and I think every single teacher has heard me say this that he's had, I'm like, mom and dad might be in my house, but that's not the case for every single child. So that's not a good way to address what a student's need are. Take this to the, to the adults at home, something like that. Imagine if you are a young black girl or a young black boy, you have a parent who might be incarcerated, you have a parent who might have succumbed to gun violence in one of our cities, right? That's like something like that alone could be a trigger. So I really think it would be great for all teachers to know what the experiences are of the children who are in front of them. A real, I have a really good friend who's a teacher in the Waterbury Public School System. And she says, if the things that those kids share with her, she goes home and cries at night because of what they're going through and what they're experiencing. And that's just because she's an educator who cares. There's no requirement for her to find out what's going on. But I think that, that would be really helpful and something that I'd love to see, you know, legislators push at the legislature because I think it's really important. I, you know, everything people push back and say different things are mandates, but I really think it's really important for educators to be able to connect with the kids. So, do, is Waterbury uh, one of the few places that's that's using it? Does anybody know any place else that is using the Aces? Sharice, are you talking to me? <laughs> She said no. Okay, so maybe. Hey, Robin, I think they've given us something to investigate, right? Something that we should probably yeah. be looking at, right? Oh yes, definitely, definitely. Has it come up, Robin, and on JPOC at all? Uh, not to my knowledge, but it may have because JPOC has been mm -hmm. around for a very long time. Um, I've only been at the legislature going on seven years okay. now, so. It's but possible, we're not here just to be pretty. We're here to take on some stuff, right? So it. we'll put that on our list of things that we at least need to look at and have a conversation about it. I had not heard about it until uh, the video, uh, watching the movie and hearing you all talk about it. So we don't want to just throw things out here and not take responsibility for at least looking into something or finding out where are we in the state. Uh, I'm not on education committee. I don't know if Robin is. Are you on education? But we know, but we know the chair, don't we? <laughs> we we can take it to the chair for that. So you know, uh, the film also examined how school officials can find new pathways for discipline by looking at negative behaviors and concentrating on health healing rather than punishing. You know, I've heard this say said, and this isn't something I've heard that's new, that we need more social workers um, in the schools to be able to work with children. They say that also in the way when you see uh, a, a violent act in the community, you know, uh, one of the things that I've recognized is that our children may see a shooting, a stabbing, uh, their mother or father being assaulted, and they just go to school, right? And they're carrying all that with them. You know, if we were to do a, a drawing of what some of our kids have witnessed and put it on their shoulders, can you imagine what they would be walking like carrying this into school every single day, right? And so what, let's talk about the, the benefits. And Jennifer, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, talk about the benefits of having someone in school. Uh, and I don't mean one, that you have to get an appointment, but someone who's available to, to talk to our children or provide that service. Um, well, I, I have a unique experience that I've been both a social worker and an educator. And, you know, I've over the years often thought, like, what exactly is the role of educators? I mean, I think that we continue to also place responsibilities on them that they were not meant to have. And so that's it's very important for an educator to know what they're dealing with in the classroom. And have an understanding of you know social emotional learning and you know co-regulation skills and restorative practices 
but it's also important to understand that um, you know they are experiencing the same trauma, and you know that interaction is creating negative results. Um, teachers are not prepared to deal with what some of these kids are sharing. And most of the social workers are not, they don't have time in their days to be sitting down with this kind of stuff. And so I think we definitely need to, you know, school districts need to employ more social workers that, you know, when these kids need time to think about their choices and be able to actually utilize their prefrontal cortexes to make rational decisions and, and not be make, trying to make decisions during periods of hot cognition that you know we can finally start to see some of the shifting. Would anyone else like to share uh, about this having social workers more ready, ready, readily available to, to students and the impact it might have? I mean, I'll weigh in a little bit, Senator Moore, because I think social workers are definitely important to have, but I think that we also need to look outside the box, right? That's what we talk about a lot, but we need to bring grassroots and community interventions into the schools. Um, you know, we have moms, grandmas, aunties, uncles, uh, and I like to think of, them, think of them as community intervention workers, right? culturally competent people that look like these students have the same lived experience as these students that can communicate with them without having to talk to them. And I'm talking about just being able to do the things that Sabira, you know, talked about earlier. You know, body language is the majority of the way we communicate. And because we're, we have different experiences and the majority of the teachers are white teachers and the majority of the students in my district are black and brown, I think it would, would really help to support not just the teachers, not just the, uh, the counselors and uh, the social workers, but bringing the village, you know, and I feel like we really have to get back to being a village and that we have to take ownership of what's going on and we have to invest in our children and we have to deal with the root causes, you know. Um, a lot of this is rooted and grounded in systemic racism. Uh, we don't talk about that a lot because it's a, it, it's a sore spot, it's uncomfortable. And I'm like, you know, we have to call it what it is. And we have to stand in the truth of that because when we tell the truth, we set ourselves free. Thank you, Representative Porter. Jessica, did you want to say something? I was just going to add, um, yes, I do believe that we do need more social workers and counselors. Um, even me as a case manager going to see a client to do a school visit, um, you know, someone who has like an individual education plan, right? And, and they're supposed to get social work hours, but they can't really see their social worker every week because there's only one social worker and she comes you know, on Fridays and, you know, he needs to see her on a Tuesday. So like most of the time we end up becoming the providers and, um, you know, I'm not a social worker, but we do, you know, it, it's, again, it's just trying to get other community members and programs involved to, you know, to get the support for, for so the client. So we have a few questions from the Facebook. Uh, we could take one of those now. Uh, so this is from uh, Missy Sky, and it says, all the potential that has been pushed out, how do we move past this and challenge the cycle? Would someone like to answer that or respond to that? How do we move on? We know what's happened in the past, right? Uh, I think, uh, and it's documented, and it's come out in many ways for us, but how do we move on? On. What are some of the things we do? Representative Porter and I have said, yes, we'll, we'll look at the ACES survey and, and work on that. So that's one thing that we can do as we, we move forward. What are some of the other things that you think that you can do? Jackie, can I ask you that at, since you're in the school system? Sure, absolutely. I think um, looking at everything that we've already talked about tonight, tonight, looking at restorative practices, making sure that systems are using restorative practices and addressing situations that happen in the building. Um, I think the other part that is important is engaging educators in those courageous conversations. Um, the history of education is that when there is a problem, you enter into dialogue. And so we have a problem, but we're afraid to talk about it. And so one of the things that we've been doing in Waterbury is we um, have this professional learning rollout where we're just 
teaching teaching teachers how to talk about race. You know, first of all, acknowledging that there are disproportionate outcomes with our students. You know, our black and brown students are, are receiving more exclusionary discipline. When you look at performance data, um, our black and brown students are being outperformed. And so we need to be honest about it and have those conversations um, and own our role in it. I think sometimes when we bring up the word racism, people get automatically defensive and like, oh, I'm not racist, you know, I chose to work in the inner city. Um, however, there's a couple of things that educators have to be willing to do. You have to be one, willing to look at your own implicit bias. We all have biases and we have to be honest about that, look at them and challenge them. But then two, also recognize that we're part of a system. You know, I, as, as happy and excited as I am about working in the education system, I have to acknowledge that there are parts of that system that keep our students from succeeding. And so again, I think it's really important for all educators to have these conversations, not just all the wonderful advocates who are on this call, but some of the people who have boots on the ground, those folks that are standing in front of our children every day have to have these conversations. You know, you use the term restorative practices. I don't know that everyone in the audience would know what that is. Can you give me some examples of what that would be? Sure, so there's two parts to, the, to restorative practice. The first part is relationship building. So putting into place um, activities that help build relationships in the classroom. The most common one in schools is what's called circle. And so the kids will begin a class sitting in a circle and the teacher will give a prompt. And everyone in that circle has an opportunity to respond. The powerful thing about circle is that is everyone is in it together. Everyone has an opportunity to speak. Everyone's voice is as important as the other one. There's no end and no beginning. Um, we're all on equal, equal ground. Um, and so the first part is building that relationship. The second part is when something happens to break that relationship, you need to do things to repair or restore the relationship. So historically, when we, looked at when we look at discipline, it's because a student has broken a rule and they need to be punished. However, restorative practice says that um, you may have done something to break this relationship and how do we restore that? And so there's a number of different ways that you can do it, but that's sort of the premise behind um, implementing restorative practices. Thank you. You know, we'd like to hear from our audience. So if you have a question, please put it in for us and have one of our panelists respond to you. Kathleen, do we have any other questions coming in? Oh, we do. And this is from Ann Hughes. She is a state representative um, in the General Assembly. So welcome, Ann. So she's, Ann says, all behavior is an attempt to meet a legitimate human need. What is the need underneath the behavior? And so I think she's talking in the way of what do they come with that they're looking for that they're not getting? Who would like to respond to that? Hannah? Um, my opinion would be that when I was in high school, a lot of students, like when our principal spoke to me in general, I said most students, the issue mainly was I, they probably didn't have a good day. They have to go through walking the street against gangs or either they didn't eat breakfast that morning or they have a problem. They have to drop off their sibling. The thing was, most adults ignored them. They weren't listening. And then finally, when the adult listened, they realized, okay, if the kid needs breakfast, let's give them breakfast. And they had a better day. Or let me talk to them. Let me bring them to another room. Like for my high school, what they did was we had an ISS room where we got rid of it. And they became the refocus room where we put affirmations on the walls. No child wants to go to a room where you see um, white walls where you're being punished. To teach a child, you're supposed to motivate them, explain to why they got into that position and how can we correct it. Thank you, Hannah. Anyone else? Yeah, Mayor, Senator Moore, that was one thing that I was going to say, um, and it, it's kind of in conjunction with answering this question. Last question, you know, what do we do? I think that we have to engage the students. We have to engage our children. We need to have open communication. Uh, one of the things in the documentary that resonated with me was that the mother said they had blind trust for the teacher and that they did not believe the daughter when she was coming home. And at seven years old, this little girl was on an overpass 
<laughs> of a highway saying to herself, I could just end this now and go to heaven and I don't have to be hurt anymore. Nobody loves me. Nobody believes me. So it, it, it ties into what Hannah is saying. You know, we have to be able to relate to, with them and meet them where they are. And I think that there, mu there needs to be much more extensive work done around urban trauma. You know, we don't talk about the baggage that these children carry and the things that they have to go through to even make it to the school. Um, and and I'm, I really do admire the school that is doing that, Hannah. I commend them for that because it's just as simple as knowing, you know, what's going on. What are they responsible for? You know, the example of being an oldest sibling, you know, it might be your responsibility to get up and make sure everybody's dressed and everybody got breakfast and getting everybody out the door and you end up being late to school or you've been up all night because that's the only time you have to study and get your work done. So, I mean, it, it, it's communication. Educators communicating mm -hmm. with the family, I think, is where we really have to hone in on. Let's let's start where it starts and it starts at home. You know, I thought it was interesting that when she went to the store and hung out in the parking lot, that they thought she was 12 years old and she was only seven. But even 12 years old, I mean, invisible, like that's normal. That's not normal during a school day to see a child uh, in a parking lot with no place to go. And how many how many other people saw that child? I mean, when you think about community, right? We all have responsibilities. When you think about a, a child wandering at seven years old and nobody stopped her, right? Uh, and and the police even didn't say, well, how old does she look? Does she look distraught? No, she's fine. That says a lot about who we are. That's that bias that Jackie was talking about when she talks of, talk about how we bring our own implicit bias to the to the table, you see a little black girl and you say, oh, she's fine. She's not crying, right? If she was doing something wrong, it'd be a whole other, whole other thing. Someone would pay attention to her if she broke the law, right? But she had that, that moment um, that she, I'm, 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 I was worried that there was going to be a bad outcome other than what it was, that something was going to, it was like a mystery, you know, drama, like what is going to happen to this child as she's walking along the street? Is someone going to snatch her? Uh, what's going to happen to her? And so I, I go back to we all have a responsibility to her and to let a child leave school and not know how long that child was gone. I think we have to take responsibility from, from the school. Is there anything? Was, you, go ahead. Go ahead, Robin. I was just going to say that was the other thing that didn't sit well with me. The fact that the father got a call at a, after 11 a.m. that morning. And when he asked, when's the last time you saw my daughter? It was at nine o'clock. This child had been missing from school for hours. So even the people that have been given charge over her, you know, and, and supposed mm -hmm. to be responsible for her, allowed her to fall through the cracks. So, you know, I think about the, the teacher to student and peer to peer relationships. Um, in schools and the dynamics in the classrooms with the schools at, at large. I often think that if, if we could, uh, and this is, you know, this is just recent, my thinking after seeing the movie, I don't, you know, I don't spend a lot of time on, on um, youth in school, but more of human services protections. But I was thinking about, you know, how we could partner high school students uh, with younger people. I know in Bridgeport at one time they were looking at putting together a community school at Harding so people could have a place to go. I don't know. Hannah, do you know anything about any of the community schools that are going on in, in Bridgeport? Is there anything like that for where children can go if they're in uh, having a moment that they can go in or have someone to talk to? Yeah. Yes, um, Mr. Powell. Well, that happened. I was in my twelfth grade year when they implemented that. Um, Mr. Powell, they got Mr. Powell to come in, and it really helped a lot of kids because a lot of kids were so shut, like they didn't know how to talk to teachers. Especially that most of the students mostly said they didn't know how to talk to teachers that weren't their color of skin, and that's what I think would trigger our principal to do something about it, because. You have kids that walk around the school and you wonder why they're not in class. And then certain teachers that will come up to them, they don't talk to. But when they saw that, they noticed that they only apply to people that spoke to their, in their language or rather in a sense, like for instance, I have seen um, some of the guards, we have Hispanic guards, we have black guards and we have Caucasian guards. When you see a Caucasian guard, the kids don't comply with them. 
they more comply with the black guards and the Hispanic guards because they're scared. Some kids are scared just to even say something. And I think that's what really triggered our principal to actually react on something, to do something about it, to say, okay, since we know this, how about we do it in a certain sense? So when they brought in Mr. Powell, most students started to go, but the only issue was that some people were taking advantage of it, where in a sense where they'll just go in there just to chill out and not go to class. That's where so, we have pros and cons. So that also relates to seeing people who are teaching and who are in the schools that look like you, right? Knowing that they may understand your condition or what you're going through. How do you, how important do you all think that having teachers of a color minority teachers in the school system is to address some of these issues? And I'll take that from anybody who wants to speak about that. I think it's very important. You know, I wanna, I go ahead, Hannah. It shows that I could be them one day and that I won't become a statistic. It shows that they made it out of somewhere where other people couldn't make it out of. And when they when they share their story in class, you say, okay, I can do the same. Unlike when it comes from a case teacher, they think it's so easy. They don't understand the struggle. Or most kids, as they say, when they come from the hood or when they come from the project, they say they, they have something on their shoulder. Every day is something. Not They don't have like an easy day just to come in school. Okay, we're going to do this today in class. Most teachers, like, because the class is too big, they don't realize who's in the class. Unless you have a student like me who's, like, who talks to the teacher, says good morning. Most teachers wouldn't even notice. You have kids in the back sitting, hood their head down. The, kids, the, student don't, the student doesn't really talk. The teacher doesn't talk to them. The teacher just ignores it and continue on with their day, which is the wrong issue and the, which is the wrong approach that they're taking because you don't know what's going on. That kid could commit suicide one day. That kid could have more to give to the world. But because we're not open enough to go to them, okay, are you okay? Is something going on? It's too much kids. Maybe if we had smaller student, smaller amount of students in classes, it would be much more better. We shouldn't have 23 students or 35 students in one class to one teacher. That doesn't help the situation. So I feel like we should have less students, like probably 15 to 1 ratio where teachers can actually know the student's name, know what's going on, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the student. I find myself like when I was in high school, same thing is happening in university too, same way. The professors don't know my name. You have to go to them to speak to them, which I feel like it should be a one one way, like a two way street where they should know who I am. I should know who they are. If I'm sitting in your class, I don't even know your name, but you're teaching me. No student's gonna wanna listen to somebody that don't even know their name. Don't even have a relationship with them. Uh, yeah. May not even make eye, eye contact with them. You know, I noticed um, it bothered me, but it might not bother everybody. Uh, when the teacher was greeting people as she was going in the room ever, and shaking hands, did anybody notice there was a young girl who didn't want to shake hands? And so I'm saying, you grabbed my arm. I didn't like that, you know, because that could have been a trigger. I know she meant well, right? And, and wanting to shake everybody's hand. But if I don't want to have to shake your hand, unless I have an agreement ahead of time that I will shake your hand every day. When she grabbed her arm, I was like, okay, is that a trigger that you, if she didn't want to, if she didn't want to grab, if she didn't want to shake your hand, obviously she didn't want to shake your hand, right? You don't have a right to put your hand on me to do that. And so that I was saying, okay, does she, does she really understand? Even the most well-meaning people mm -hmm. uh, want to do the right thing. But I think it's about being conscious all the time when you're, no matter who you are, and a teacher in any environment, but in schools with children most especially, that uh, even though you may mean well, it is, is, you still need to think twice. You can't ever be in this place where you're so comfortable that you feel like anything you want to do is okay to do. Representative Porter, did you want to say something? Well, yeah, you just made me, you just, you just made me think about um, the four 12 year old girls that got strip searched. And I'm like, you know, what if these girls have been molested? What if they've been, you know, sexually assaulted? I mean, like, why would you need to strip search the students? You know, um, and then the other thing, just going back to why it's important to have teachers in a classroom that look like us. I mean, part of the, the, the pipeline that we're trying to fill with minority teachers, black and brown teachers, is 
how do you be, you, you, you see, you, you want to be what you see. And if they're not seeing us in the classrooms, in these seats of power and, and, and seats of, I mean, what's more powerful than education? It's what levels the playing field for all of us. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's really important to have them. And I thought it was interesting when they made mention of, you know, like from 1890 to 1910, how um, the numbers rose, right? We went from 15,000 black teachers in this country to over 60,000. And then when we desegregated schools, we know what happened. And that's what we've been fighting ever since. So um, there's plenty that you and I, Senator Moore, can work on to help get this done, you know? Um, but I don't think that it all needs to be done legislatively. I think that th these things need to be changed at the, at the core and at the root. And, and, and that's when you make progress, when you pluck it from the root. Because if you don't get it there, it's, it's like weeds. They just come back and they grow in, in, in different places in different forms. So, you know, with that, so the film examined how school officials can find new pathways for discipline uh, by looking at negative behaviors and concentrating on healing rather than punishing. Uh, any of you want to speak to the innovative ways that mental health and trauma are being used in schools with our children? And is there a movement to m mitigate triggers and avoid re-traumatization? Um, my question was um, when I was watching the film, if you noticed, like I was in high school, I noticed that a lot in other schools everywhere in inner city schools, the first thing that they want to do to students that act up is say, oh, they have a mental problem. And they don't look at anything else. They just assume that they're either special ed. They bring them straight to the classroom. They don't say nothing. There's a lot of students that are in special ed right now that don't need to be in special ed. And which doesn't make no sense. Like the school, it seems like they just shut them in there and it's like, okay, they don't have to deal with the problem anymore. That's the problem. They want to pass the, the problem on to other people. Think it's going to help. It's not helping. It's just making the child's life worse in a sense. And Hannah, that goes back to our earlier conversation about having social workers available in the school because as Jennifer said, all teachers are not available or, or don't have the training to be a social worker, right? Or do, this, do that type of social worker. But I also think there should be, uh, as I think about this, it's easy for me to say I'm not the teacher, but some type of sensitivity training, something to deal with trauma. Uh, you know, I know teachers take breaks during the year for, for different training. I think we need to start looking at racial bias. I know as a legislator in this next session, after looking at Black Lives Matter and all the things that have transcended since then, that my everything that I do in the way of legislation, I will be asking people to look through a racial lens, equity lens. How, what, what role is racism playing in the decision you made? Uh, you can have all the conversations you want, but the bottom line is what role is that playing, right? And in, in your decision. So that type of training needs to take place. But I think it does speak to having uh, people who understand children uh, in the school and readily available. Uh, and it, I don't, I don't know, uh, another pathway, but I'd like to hear Jackie or Jennifer, if you or Jessica, any of you think of any other way that that could be introduced into the schools? Without um, doing I can just say that I know that in Bridgeport there were there was some type of trauma uh, group or trauma informed group of people that were trying to come together to go into the schools to deal with with, with those kids who were dealing with trauma, um, spe you know, specifically for kids who you know, had a friend that, that got shot yesterday and, you know, didn't want to go to school or were dealing with their emotions differently. So, I mean, I think having some type of trauma group, you know, a group of, of professionals to go in to deal with that, that might, that might definitely help. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. Jennifer? Um, I, I think for a long time, we've been ignoring, um, the trauma that schools cause. And I think that that, you know, we need to take a moment to actually think about it. I mean, we've been dealing with over a decade of school shootings. You know, schools are not a place of healing in many forms. And so when when you do not have that healer, not learning happening. Um, at any point that the brain is clicked into a trauma response, it's not available for learning. 
And so whatever form that comes in, whether it's educational equity, racial equity, you know, trauma-informed education, um, all of these things need to happen because these buildings are not sources of healing or learning. Jennifer, you, you hit it on the head with that. You just tr triggered something for me when you said that. I mean, you know, it's fight or flight, right? Mm -hmm. So why are we surprised that the behaviors and the responses that we get from children when they're in these abusive and, and bullying situations and, and this activity and behavior is actually coming from the adults? You know, the ones mm -hmm. that are supposed to be there to serve and protect them and educate them and, you know, help them teach them how to grow. You know, one of the people in the um, documentary, she said, you know, we just we just want to know how to be better. Everybody wants to know how to be a better individual and we need to create these spaces. And I think that we have to engage parents and students and community members in the development of implementation. Right. Of more educationally sound and equitable policies and practices. I say it all the time. The people closest to the problems are closest to the solutions. So as we discuss what we need to do, we must make sure that they are at the table and that their voice is their voice, that we don't need to be a voice for them. You know, in our community, we say a lot, right? We don't need a white savior. We need resources and opportunities. Well, we have to make sure that we're practicing that within our communities with one another as well. And that we're not speaking for one another, but we're allowing each other and our children to have a voice so that they understand that they matter. They matter, that they matter and we care about them. And I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. I just wanted to add even beyond um, offering opportunity is the support for children to be able to meaningfully access those opportunities. And so we can throw opportunities at kids all day long but if there's not mom or dad at home or there's not a caring teacher or, or a mentor at you know, a boys and girls club, someone in these child's lives to support them um, to access these opportunities. You know, we keep throwing opportunities at them and wondering why they're not successful. Well, they're not successful because they don't have supports to access them. So that was a great segue because there's there's a young person on right now, 16 years old, that has a question, and I'd like to take that question. This is from Chelsea Morton, and she's a 16-year-old junior, and the documentary spoke about the lack of teachers of colors in the public school system. Knowing this, do you believe cultural sensitivity training should be the priority? And I appreciate, I was gonna speak about this young lady um, and how an incident happened in uh, her school with her teacher and her hair. And uh, her mom worked on it. I don't think they got the resolve that they wanted, but I do wanna say this. It did uh, move this young lady to work uh, during the Black Lives Matter and beyond to speak up about what takes place and racial bias. So I appreciate her question. Would you all like to speak to that question? So what I'd like to say is, I keep saying DEI is like this buzzword now, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's kind of, it's fashionable. It's what corporations use. Everybody sent out a statement after the murder of George Floyd. But what we're not doing is changing the systems that were built on systemic racism. So for example, if you look at we, all the work we've done on minority teacher recruitment and retention, there are still boards of ed in Connecticut who have not, and the human resources professionals, who have not gotten implicit bias training. So if you look at how few school leaders you have that are people of color, superintendents you have that are people of color, that's because they cannot get the job. It's not because that there's not a pipeline. A couple of years ago, after we've done all this work, we found out, um, if you remember Representative Ford, there were over 250 black and brown teachers in Connecticut who were certified who couldn't get a job. But we, uh, we've been fighting and saying, we need to have more teachers of color. But if they are certified, why is it that they're not in a classroom? And there's many cities, Hartford and Bridgeport in particular, that have long-term subs. So you have teachers who are waiting for a job and cannot get a job, but the school system itself is hiring, is having a long-term sub in that classroom instead of having a certified teacher, which we can talk all day about certified teachers and if that's the exact solution to the issue. But we need a commitment. And these systems were designed 
to leave certain people outside of them. You gave the statistic about like the changes. So we have to be intentionally and design them to make sure that they're more inclusive. And that's just one example of where you could get more people. When we think about it, you have people who are, they're Sunday school teachers who can connect to kids in ways that many people cannot connect with them. There are coaches in the community that can connect to, to kids in many ways that others can't commit, connect to them. So the idea that you need to have a, per, a person in front of that classroom that has rubber stamped all these credentials that are essentially based on systemic racism, we have to check that. And we have to, like, we need people who are great teachers and who can connect with our kids and make sure at the end of the day they can go on to whatever path they want to be successful. So there's a lot of work that can be done. And I think, you know, we've started some of this work, but the idea that I think HR is a big issue. HR within the school system, HR in many different places in our state, that's where, like, that's what we're butting up against because those individuals are constantly looking for a fit that many times looks like them. You talk about that mirror. If you are a white woman or a white man, you are looking for someone that looks like you when you're trying to fill a job. Thank you, Sabira. Would anyone else like to comment? I would just say, and our children are looking for teachers that look like them, right? I think that's important. Well, and our children are, I mean, I know as a parent, children are looking for teachers that don't look like them. You know, I wish that my son had more diversity in his teaching, you know, in his classroom, because he's learning from people that look like him, that potentially think like him, and is not being challenged or encouraged to, you know, build connections with people that don't look like him. That is so true. And, and we stress that. I mean, Sabira, you can you can validate this in our minority teacher recruitment task force. You know, we stress that, you know, having teachers of color is not only good for children of color. It's good for everyone because it, it does just that, Jennifer. It exposes you to a culture that you're not familiar with, a lived experience that you're not familiar with. Us being different shouldn't make us deviant you know, and our skin tone should not criminalize us, but that is exactly the system that we are born into. So when we talk about a school to prison pipeline, I talk about a crib to coffin pipeline because I don't get to take this skin off. This is how I entered the world and this is how I'm gonna leave the world. But I, I definitely agree with you. This is, it's good for everyone, all of us, no matter what color you are. It plays out in future, right? And we all, we all could win, right? And it's not always about more money. It's about doing the right thing from the beginning instead of trying to fix. And that is true probably with all the systemic problems that they're saying that a result of systemic racism, all these things that are built in already, and we continue to build on them, right? Instead of breaking down that structure and, and trying to start something new, we we're trying, and I said this earlier today to someone, we keep trying to put this, this square peg in this round hole and banging in there, we're not getting it. It's, it, is, it, it doesn't make sense. And it costs us. In human life, it costs us. It costs us in, in training um, uh, other people to, to do the right thing. The, if, the, if this training was uh, implicit bias, at racial bias, understanding how we built this country was ingrained in, in education for teachers, for doctors, you know, across the board. You start at the beginning and you start undoing racism by training people from the beginning on what, who, that we're all valuable, that the color of our skin should not make a difference to you. You should not be treating any of us any differently because of the color. It goes into light skin, dark skin girls too, that light skin girls can get away with some stuff that some dark skin girls can't. It get, goes to a, a girl who's tall for her age. My daughter is six foot one. I'm five too. I know what it looks like when she stands over me, but I am her mother, right? Nonetheless, she knows what I'll, what you can do and what you can't do. But a teacher could be threatened by the size of it. And she's been about, she's been six feet for even when she was in high school. All those things are threatening to some people. It shouldn't be. You, you should be dealing with these children individually and be prepared that you're going to see all different sizes, uh, how people talk. You know, don't judge them by how they talk uh, or their speech or their language. All those things need to be taught from the ground up so we break down the systems. It's one thing to break down a system. It's one another to build a new system. I'm not trying to break anything down. 
I'm trying to build new systems with people like you all and work toward building a better system for all of our children that we all can uh, learn from, but we can make a better world from, which will produce better children who have the things that they need. And that's that cycle I want to get on. I want to get on that, that cycle of good things keep coming. What's, what's coming next? Because we did the right things at the entry level. Is there another question that we can, uh, from anyone from on Facebook? Well, it's 725. I think we're going to 730. I think, Kathleen, do you want to come in and, and say anything? I do want to say this has been, a uh, for me, it warms my heart. Uh, I'm, uh, on a snowy day, I am so happy to be here with you all and have this conversation uh, and be able to hear your voices. I appreciate all of you all uh, lending your time and talents. And I also appreciate you beyond today and what you do in the community, because this is really the community that needs to be magnified uh, so we can have more people. And I know there are many more people out in the community doing this, but it's important for people to see this and to hear us talk about that and share these ideas, because we need other people in the field to start thinking if nothing else, start thinking differently about how we see our children. And, and uh, you know, even for someone my age, you know, when I see a, a young person, what I think they should be doing may not be correct because I'm from a three generations back, right? I don't need to be judging these kids for what they do. I just need to get cool, <laughs> get with the program. That's all I need to do. And so uh, we all have our biases. As you said, Jackie, we all come with our biases. I come with mine from three generations different from the kids that are in school now. But I do, I do work on all of the time not judging anyone when I see them, even though it comes into my mind. I have this moment where I say, who are you? Uh, so thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, thank you all to the, the producers and maker of this, this film. I appreciate it. I encourage people to, to read the book, to, to get this out far and wide uh, about this. And thank you very much. Kathleen? Thank you, uh, Senator Moore, for, and, uh, for being here tonight. And all of you panelists, uh, for your time, for your work, for your passion. Um, and thank you, everybody that's out here, out there listening. We've had great turnout and a lot of conversations uh, through the comments. Sorry we couldn't get to everything there. Um, but thank you for viewing the film. We put it out in the chats, uh, the comment sections for the Facebook feed, so you can see the film tonight, too, if you haven't yet, but also for taking part in this discussion. Um, I hope all of you read it after this is processed and goes up as a video. If you go back and look at all the comments, they were amazing. Uh, people really know that we need to talk about this. And um, the filmmakers have said, that it is our sincerest hope, our sincerest hope that we foster a deeper appreciation and understanding of black girls in our society. That by heightening awareness of the systemic challenges they face during their youth, we can ameliorate how they are unfairly perceived and treated in schools. I'm gonna ask my panelists to stay here for one more minute. I'm gonna give another plug for the Connecticut ACES <laughs> Task Force. Um, we are committed to continuing co community conversation through additional films and panel discussions. And our hope for the future is to build a movement for trauma-informed and resilient communities. So I thank you all. Um, I'm gonna show one last slide here as we go out. And these are the core beliefs of our um, task force, our efforts center on the voices of those directly impacted by ACEs. Expanding opportunity and addressing inequities and disparities is the essential thread through all of our work. Racism is a public health crisis that exacerbates ACEs. And while trauma-informed care directs us to shift from asking what is wrong to you to what has happened to you, we need to go further to determine what have we, the systems, institutions, and organizations done to you. Um, the systems are not broken and we must recognize our role and rehabilitate our relationships with the community members most impacted. Please feel free to reach out if you're interested in learning more about our task force. There's an email address there. And I, again, I thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a nice evening. <laughs>